You are now entering the LuxCore Studios. And you've secured a seat for the Protecting Your Radius podcast. Here, Here, we build connections from your contracting profession to some of the top bleeding edge products and services. Don't get deterred. Let's not delay. Here is your host, Nathan Downs. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Protecting Your Radius podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Downs, and today we have Eric Spitali back on uh, with us to talk more about commercial contracting and everything. So, Eric, hey, welcome again. Welcome back. First two-time guest on the show, buddy. Oh, fantastic. Thank you for having me again. Absolutely. So I'm going to get let you get right back into it because I know there was a number of different things we discussed, prevailing wage, government municipal jobs, how to find them, all those different things. So let's just pick up the pace, man, and get right back into it. Yeah, I think something looking back where I left out and I'd like to jump into is as far as the prevailing wage, if you're an owner operator, um, that's an exemption. So let's say you own the company and you got your brother with you, right? And maybe he's not an owner, he's an employee. When you're filling out your certified reports, you can claim an exemption uh, so you don't have to pay yourself as a prevailing wage employee. uh, And you can literally just write exempt across your information where where your name is, owner exempt. Um, so that's a way for some of the smaller guys uh, that are working in the field that can get in there uh, and just get you know more money in their pocket without having to pay those payroll taxes, uh, et cetera. So that's one thing I wanted to talk about. Um, the other thing is uh, WMBEs, which is Women Minority Business Enterprises. Um, so these, and there's also a bunch of other ones where it's a uh, disadvantaged, veteran, et cetera. These are all government certifications that you can get and the government puts out these contracts and they might have requirements for how much is a percentage of that job or all of that job has to go to one of these contractors. So if you're a woman owned business, um, this is a one way to get into this. Uh, definitely get that credential because you're going to have tons of businesses out or tons of contracts out there. that are going to have a requirement for it. Um, you know, like I said, women, minority business enterprises, veteran enterprises, disadvantaged enterprises. So this is something you want to look up and see if you qualify for. And you'll have to go through, you know, some sort of certification process. But I see bids all the time that say, you know, we require a 5% uh, woman-owned business on this project. So if I'm a prime on that project, I'm going to reach out to some of the other companies that I know, uh, and I'm going to hire them to do maybe 5%, if not more, depending on what their capabilities are, to cover that requirement. Um, So that's something I wanted to jump into, as well as uh, some of the larger projects. You might have a project manager or a site supervisor that aren't necessarily on prevailing wage. So you might have guys on site, um, like a project manager, I think the rule is you can't be doing more than 30% of the field, the hands-on work. But a project manager can be out there directing a job, uh, filling out all this paperwork um, on that site, and that might be a salaried employee. So there's different things. It's just the guys that are in the field that are going to get that prevailing wage credential. Typically, a project manager might have a better benefits package with you anyway. Um, so yeah, I think those are two things that you should definitely look into. Um, the next one is I want to talk about reports. Oh yeah. I was going to ask you a question. So do you think, um, first off, is there a, a white male certification? (laughs) Don't answer that. Don't answer that. Don't answer that. (laughs) Ah, we got canceled again. Uh, both of Eric's episodes have been canceled. Uh, no, it was, a, that was a joke. Everyone out there, calm yes. down. Total yes. joke. So, um, no, but seriously, like, you know, service disabled vets and uh, the women owned business and stuff. You know, um, I had a opportunity on a job years ago that uh, the Tulsa County, so the county where we're at, um, they actually asked. So this is very rare down here. We're, we're an at will state, right to work state. Uh, don't have any unions except for like an American Airlines. That's it. You right. know, so everything right. else is just, again, you hear me talk about this all the time on the podcast. We're the wild, wild west. I mean, you know, right. you just kind of do whatever you want, you know, just make sure it's legal, you know, or whatever. But the state's like pretty cool about just kind of letting it go. That being said, Tulsa County had requirements, Eric, that um, 10% of our bid, even as subcontractors, had to meet these requirements. So what right. we did, this is pretty slick, we did was uh, um, I called a couple companies that did uh, uh, construction site cleanup. 
that met those sure. requirements, right? And I was right. like, listen, I, you know, and, and this one lady was like, well, we, I got build, man, I don't want your builders, ma'am. I mean, let's be right. honest. Right. Like, <laughs> what I want you to do is I want to pay you, you know, if uh, my contract's 100000 I want to pay you 10000 bucks, and you come out and right. clean up the job site and just send right. one right. guy every day or come out at the end of the right. week. I really don't care. It's just to get the job right. and stuff. And, and so that's what we did. It was so slick. And she was super happy. And I'm like, is this like, you know, the best use of taxpayers' dollars? I don't really know. But I don't care. That is the game and the rules that were written. And I was right. playing within the rules of the game, you know, and, and stuff like that. And and what was cool about that to me was we got to meet these people and know them. And they were super cool. And, like, um, she hired specific, like, minor, like at-risk minorities and stuff. So I was like, dude, this is right. a really cool yeah. idea, you know, because it's something simple to bring them into our industry. That th Like, these guys right. were, like, two of them were, like, ex-cons and stuff. Um, would never have sure. gotten these jobs, like, like – you know, uh, just normally off the street, but because of her program and her business model and all that stuff. Yeah. It was, it was pretty cool, man. Like I, we felt good about it. We're like, I mean, we're paying these guys yeah. a lot of money to do this, sure. but you know, sure. like, whatever. So, right. you know, again, it's designed federal government, you know, municipality government, local government, it's all designed to level the playing field. And that's just a way that they level it as well. Um, Reports. I wanted to jump into reports, and I know we kind of broadly based or jumped into this a little bit, but um, you know, back to the details. Jumping into this work, you're going to need to have a lot of reports. It's all paperwork. This is how this sort of work gets done. Uh, the work in the field, obviously, you want to crank it out. You know, it's a numbers game. You you know, the less time you're on the job, the more money, like any other job. Um, but reporting. So uh, I think we touched on scheduled values. Um, in your contract with the GC, you're going to have a schedule of values and you can, this is a way to get paid uh, down, you know, payments down the project. So if you schedule your values, so we're going to post this job um, in X amount of time and then we want to check on it. And then we're going to, uh, you know, rail and stretch and then we want to check on it. And then we're going to hang gates and then we want to check on it. So a schedule of values is important. That's going to be determined within your contract. Uh, that's also going to go back on those AIA reports that I, that I spoke about earlier in the last episode. Um, you know, you got your sign-in sheets, which we touched about. Um, safety meetings. A lot of these GCs uh, and or governments are going to require safety meetings. Uh, we said, we talked about OSHA, um, but beyond that, your toolbox safety meeting. You may have to have a report for that every day to submit. Um, so that's another one in daily reports. Now, depending on how you set up your company, I like to have daily reports. It's pretty basic what we did today, what the weather was like, uh, if there was any incidents, who spoke to who, uh, and this is kind of a CYA. So you can go back and say, well, you know, Hey, this fence is down, right? You guys didn't do this portion of the fence. Well, in fact, I have a list that we did this portion and somebody must've hit it or took it or whatever, whatever happened, you know, it just covers you. Um, RFIs we spoke about, requests for information, uh, change orders. Uh, you want to have a change order sheet. A change order is going to change the price of the project. They want to add a gate, an additional gate. You're going to write a change order up. Uh, field order is uh, no charge to them, but it might be a difference in what you have with your plan. So a field order is going to say, we're moving this gate from this location to this location. So, you know, the paperwork is important um, just to get all the everybody in a row. Um, once you once you complete your job for a GC, um, back to these bonds, um, there's going to be something called a lien release. Uh, and this might be a, a partial lien release or a full lien release. What that allows is you to no longer claim a lien against the surety company or the bond. So you're saying, yes, we were paid on this project, or yes, we were paid this portion that was completed. And the GC is going to cover themselves saying, okay, sign this lien release. And you can do that as well with any subcontractors that you have. Um, as the job goes down, you're going to have to keep performing reports, which is, let's say you're on a job for three months. You're you just kick off the job. You're getting in there early, but then there's going to be a month lag, and then you're back on the job a month later. Um, throughout that process, you're submitting your certified payroll reports, whether whoever the GC is, but within the work that you haven't done, you're still keeping 
uh, non-performing report. It basically, it's just it's it is what it says. It's just not performing. We didn't perform this week. Um, I utilize Paychex, and Paychex has a sister company called LCP Tracker. A lot of the big GCs will also use LCP Tracker. Um, that's a paid service that kicks out these reports for me. Like I said in the last podcast, we uh, when I started, everything was done by hand. As you grow, you know, you take on a little bit more risk. You try to make a little bit more money. You spend a little bit more money, et cetera. So there's different avenues that can start saving you time down the road. Yeah, that's great. That's great, Eric. What do you think? Um, you mentioned like the schedule values and stuff like that. What do you see? Like, so what does that actually look like on the paper itself? Like if you had, does it give you every type of scope you have? And then um, if I remember correctly, then it has a percentage of that scope, that portion of the project, correct? Correct. Correct. Yeah. So on that material stored, you can do. Right. Right. So back to that contract, when you're signing that contract that you're writing up, uh, you're going to say, well, we're going to have material in this area or in this time frame, um, we want to be paid on that. So you're going to submit. Now, again, you're not going to be paid immediately. You're going to submit for payment and wait your 30 days to get paid, but it's a way to start it. You might ask for a mobilization on the job, but it's going to get you paid right from the beginning. We can't start this job until we have X amount of dollars. And you might be able to work that in. So that covers your material cost or a portion of your material cost. Um, so the schedule values is going to set you up. And again, you negotiate that. So, 50%. If 50% of the job is complete, we'd like a check and we're going to submit for it and break it down however you will, whatever makes sense to you. Um, you know, back to That's the awesome. rate. Yeah. The rates for prevailing wage, this is super easy to look up. Um, you're just going to Google prevailing wage rates in your state. Uh, the state's going to have a website. It's going to tell you specifically. Most of the time, at least in the tri-state area, which is New York, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, it's going to be a chain link guy is going to fall under iron worker. And it's going to be specific iron worker fence erector. Um, so that's what we kind of look at. And if you're doing a vinyl job, uh, it might fall something on the wood job, might fall into carpenter, et cetera. So you got to kind of work within and find out what, what those uh, vocations are. Um, you have your wage and your supplemental benefit. I think we touched on that. The wage is X dollars. The benefit is also X dollars combined. It's your total pay. Um, and that benefit is there too. So your guys can get, you know, health insurance. They can get uh, whatever they need, 401k, whatever, whatever they want to put that money into. Um, another thing that you can do is apprenticeship programs. Uh, so if you get into the prevailing wage almost all the time there is a pr apprenticeship program. This is a program that you have to set up most likely with the labor board. It has to be approved. Um, but you can set up an apprenticeship program much like a union would work. So you'd have a first year, a second year, a third year, and then a journeyman. Uh, that's a way if you're a young company, you got young guys that want to learn um, to get them in with some of the older guys, you can save a little money uh, as well as teach them like you're doing now, teach them the way you want, want things done. Right. Do you think um, when you're looking at commercial bidding and, and these projects and stuff like that, do you think there's certain areas that you had a harder learning curve to go through on this? Like, was it the reporting? Was it making sure that estimating was correct? Was it the actual production side of it? Where, where do you think was the biggest hurdle when you first started doing it? Yeah, I think just uh, learning the process. I'll give you an example. Um, in New York, an iron worker is allowed to work seven hours a day in New York City. Uh, when I first started, I figured it's an eight-hour day. These guys are going to work eight hours. Um, turns out that I was not in compliance. Uh, the labor board got a hold of me uh, and back charged me for X amount of dollars because they were supposed that eighth hour was time and a half. So they back charged me for that information. So that's that's what guys hear and they're like, oh man, I don't want to get involved with that. But I, that was a hard lesson to learn. However, that being said, I'll never make that mistake again. Now you guys won't. <laughs> um, exactly. Um, what do you what do you see as challenges today? I mean, six years in on your own and stuff like that. What what challenges do you guys experience now? I think for us there's a uh, some of the challenges that we're having now is we've grown exponentially. So our overhead is a lot higher than some of the other guys that are doing this. So we've kind of priced ourselves out of um, a certain certain job frame or a certain job uh, cost. 
So we're kind of looking for some of the, you know, 100K plus jobs. But the, um, you know, there's a lot of guys out there that, you know, like I said, it's just them, their brother, whatever. They're going to be owner exempts on it. And they can just be more competitive than us. So as we've grown, I think that's our, our challenge. But we've also started to take on with getting the bonding capabilities, with getting, you know, the insurances, learning the process. We can also go after some of the bigger jobs that those guys can't as well. So that's kind of where we're at. But it's a it's a it's a it's a learning process, and you know you're not going to jump in. And I'd say it's very rare if you get that two million dollar job you were talking about. I mean that would be fantastic. It's uh it's rare to jump into that without having the credentials that you're able to do it and the bonding capacity and all that. So that some of the bigger jobs, airports and stuff, are going to weed out some of the smaller guys. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of the time I've said to myself, we're capable of doing this job, but I can't get it because of X, Y, and Z. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So um, that being said, what do you see as like the different thresholds in, in fencing? Because because you guys are at a, a in a market that, you know, would be just because of your labor and stuff like that. It's going to be quite a bit higher than normal. But right, right. I mean, would you say like if you're, you know, a million less, you're you're small into commercial contracting, you're one to five, you're, you're one to three or something in, you know, five to 10, 10 to 10 to 50, you know, or whatever, like, what do you think those break points are? Because I have like, and we've talked about it and I'll continue to talk about it. I have like this thesis set up for size of company, um, for residential that seems mm -hmm. to be appropriate through market. The only variance is your cost of living that COLA, so to speak, cost of living adjustment. Right. That will right. dictate a lot, right? Because if my labor right. here was $25 and where you're at, it's $30 an hour or something like that. Okay, obviously, that's going to skew the revenue numbers and whatnot. Sure. But that being said, I mean, like, like you know, with getting into numbers on your end or not, um, personally, like, what do you see? Like, what were what do you see as stepping points along the way to say, like, hey, we've gone from a small to a, you know, a, a little bit like a medium sized company to like, here's where the big boys are playing and stuff. Right, so right. we have some so numbers I mean, to. I mean, from, from my company, I think we're right in the middle. You know, it's funny because the SBA, uh, they, they say a small business is anything under 25 million, right? So we're nowhere near 25 million. But within, within the, uh, the fence world, <laughs> right within the fence world, I think we're um, we're we're fairly established within the the public works. Um, there's a lot of competition. New York City, that this whole area, the reason the guys get such high rate is because of the cost of living. Um, but I think we're right there in the middle. And there's a uh, you know there's some competitors out there. And my philosophy, quite honestly, is there's enough work for everybody. Um, the bidding process is. You know, that can be tedious going through these bids, reading them, making sure you understand them, getting them out on time, making sure they're signed correctly. I actually just had a bid that I was the lowest bidders for a razor ribbon job at a prison. Um, and I forgot to sign one page and the government threw it out. And it was a nice job. It was like a 200K plus job. Uh, and they said, OK, you were the lowest bidder, but you've been you've been, you know, you don't have it because you forgot that paperwork. So, you know, again, I'm still learning lessons. <laughs> I'll never let that happen again. Yeah. Uh, trust uh, me. I think we've all done stuff like that. <laughs> if you do commercial bidding, you're like, Oh, right. What did I forget? Right. Well, you know, right. we, in one of the things we often laugh, laugh about in our marketplace is um, there are a lot of guys that have been in fencing for a long period of time down here, Eric, but they're, um, they're not detail oriented people. Right, so right. it's kind of a running joke between me and several other competitors that like, if you win a job we immediately turn to each other and go, so what'd you miss? Like, would right, you forget? Right. Sure. <laughs> You're like, sure. Oh, yeah. Sometimes I see that too. And I'll, I'll lose a job uh, in a bidding process by let's say a hundred thousand dollars. And then in my head, I'm like, well, I don't know how they're going to do it, but obviously that works for them. And I'm glad that it works for them because that wouldn't work for me. It's the ones that you, that are two thousand dollars or five thousand dollars when they're that close, then you're like, oh, man, you know, if we just drop that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm excited to see. Like we were talking about that one, we still haven't heard uh, on the first episode. We still haven't heard back about that uh, hospital project, that government job. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, right. I'm still anxious to see what the bid tabulations showed or if they'll even give us right. any information on that because I'm like, well, what did everyone mark this up at? <laughs> Cause right. it could be right. all over the board. I mean, you know, and we had people from just like you guys see, we had people from all five neighboring States bidding this job. So, I mean, who freaking knows right. it could go anywhere. What's nice about a job like that is you're going to have, it's the fence guys you got to worry about. You're going to have GCs that just have uh, a bidding department. They're sitting there and they're just going to bid it. But the GCs don't know the nuances of fence. So it's the other fence companies that you have to worry about. So that's what I look at a list of who's bidding the project. I'm like, okay, that that the, those are the four guys out of 20 that I'm worried about. Um, that being said, you just brought up something. Uh, it was bid tabulations. So every project or every bid that you send out government-wise, um, the GCs won't do this, but the government will then put out a bid tabulation. So you can see where you were uh, in that in that bid, um, and you can kind of keep that metric, those numbers as a metric to say, well, in this area, this job, you know, I'll look back at a post and rail job for, uh, for a railway walk that we just did, and I'll just say, what was the numbers here? How does that transfer to over here, you know? So the bid tabulations are good. And if you're savvy enough, there's the Freedom of Information Act, which is either the FOIL or the, there's a couple different acronyms for it. But if a bid's gone out before, let's say it's a requirements contract or a contract for a school district for fencing, you can request that information and see who had the contract and what it was awarded for and base it off of that too. Now, COVID kind of jammed with all the price increases, kind of jammed all that to bits. So everything's kind of happening again now, whether it was a three-year contract or a five-year contract. But that's a way to kind of look back and say, um, you know, can we be competitive? What were their numbers? Um, can are we, you know, can we do it? Can we not do it, et cetera? So that's just typically a request. Uh, you'll have to fill out some paperwork, typically online, and send it in. Got it. Cool. What else? Um Man, what else? We've talked um, about so much. Like, Yeah, so uh, rates. Um, when you're looking at rates, uh, you can find these online, but you also want to pay attention to overtime and holiday codes. Um, per the state, there's going to be, like I said, this seven hour or eight hour. You know, you want to look at the rates and see where they're at uh, and see if there's holiday codes they can't work on President's Day or, you know, Christmas, whatever it is. So... Um, so does that have that in your, um, like in the no. prevailing wage documents or where does where do you find those? Yeah. So, yeah. so a lot of the time on the government bids, they'll include the prevailing, the entire prevailing wage rate, weight, wage sheets. Um, so that information is going to be on when you find the vocation that you're working under, it's going to be on that page or you can look it up online. So what happens if I do, uh, if I'm doing certified payroll, it's prevailing wage and I misclassify someone and it's not on purpose, it's accidental, but right, like, right. let's say I put them under, like in our state, I put them under general labor because I'm like, they're just digging holes or something. Should right, they have right. been a fence erector? Cause they ain't erecting a fence. They didn't touch a fence. Right. Yeah, I try to use laborers and fence erectors. Those are kind of the two go-to when it comes to, when it comes to, you know, um, what they call, you know, chain link or ornamental. For over 30 years, Southwest Automated Security has been the premier provider of gate operators, access controls, CCTV, and so much more. Visit southwestautomated.com today, taking dealers to the next level. Um, all right, that being said, there's uh, a number of different wage classifications you can use, uh, and you got to look into it. Again, it's in the details. You may be able to use a laborer. There may be uh, a division or a, a certain a guy that's using a rock drill. There might be an engineer for that, all right? So there's a couple different labor rates that you can look into, and some of them may save you money. Others may be more expensive. If you have a guy in a skid steer... Do you ever split someone come up under between the different trades? Erector, or you but just go you might look and one. say, well, an, an operator is $10 less an hour. So I know that Joe's going to be in that machine. We're going to pay him there. Um, so there's a bunch of ways to skin that cat. No, certainly you can. And it gets it can get um, a little bit intense tracking that. Um, but I don't try to split them up uh, per the day unless they're on different sites. 
Um, but you can split them up throughout the week because I might have somebody building a wood fence on Monday um, that then Monday afternoon has to go do a chain link fence. So I'll track them separately because they're two different jobs. But on the same job, ease, you know, let's not make it complicated for ourselves, you know? Gotcha. You know? Gotcha. So we've discussed a lot about barrier of entry um, with a number of these things. Eric, what, like on the, how about the barrier of exit, right? Now, so like, what I mean by that is uh, like the billing process. So we, like we talked about the AIA sheets, the 702, 703, you know, schedule values, scopes, you know, making sure that's right. But it always seemed to me like billing was like this big arduous task that I didn't have time for. Now, granted, because I'm the one doing the bidding, the estimating, doing everything. And trying to project manage, like that's a whole thing. Right. But but that is maybe where some of the guys that want to get into this are going to step into that. And I'm like, it is brutal having to do it all. But like, what would you sure. say, like on that end, like closing out, like doing closeout documents and stuff like that. But but then as you've expanded, what were some of the areas that you had other people maybe already in the business or you hired to assist right. to? get through some of those chat like hurdles through the process flow. Right. So like you, I've worn many hats. I've done pretty much everything within this business. Um, maybe not well, but I've done it all. Um, that being said, the, uh, you know, I have an office manager that I trained on how to do this prevailing wage, uh, billing, how to submit properly, uh, how to do progress payments, um, how to calculate, you know, retainage. A lot of the times there's going to be retainage on the contract, which is typically 5%. Uh, and that's going to be all what they call paid when paid. So you might finish a job, you might bill, you might get everything for that job except the last 5%. And that 5% might take a year. It might take, when they typically call it paid when paid. So whenever the GC is done, that enables the GC to call you back and say, hey, there's an issue. You're still owed money. There's an issue. If you want to get that last 5%, you got to come fix it. Um, and that's in your contract as well. Um, you're going to need a notary, whether you go to the local bank, um, which is typically free, uh, or you have someone on your team become a notary. You're going to need a notary for a lot of stuff. Um, just to get the documents when you're bidding, as well as when you're signing, and as well as when you're closing out. Like we talked about lien releases, um, those are always going to be notarized. So they want to know that someone else saw it and wrote it down. Yeah, we, uh, everyone in my office is a notary. <laughs> oh, fancy. <laughs> I just said, how much is it? Like 80 bucks? Right. Everybody's a notary. <laughs> <laughs> for that reason cuz i have been in situations where i'm like there there no one no one has a no. right you know right. you know what i'm saying like uh, it's happened too many times where i'm like nah we're just everyone's a notary <laughs> um you know the uh the labor board i want to talk a little bit about the labor board we've brought that up so the labor board can be a resource as well as an enemy. I don't want to say enemy, but if you get into trouble or you do something wrong and they get their grips on you, they're going to dig through every project you've ever done. Um, but they're also a resource. You can call your local labor board if you're unsure on the wage. You can call and say, hey, I want to confirm that this is what it is, and they'll give you that information. Um, there is some requirements that not everybody follows. It depends on the size of the job. If you're on a job for two days, Technically, you're supposed to have all the wages posted on the job. Now, the labor board's not going to come out there and say, where's your posting? But they could. But, you know, you're in and out. But some of the larger jobs, you might be on for, you know, an airport or a big job. They're, they're going to have you post that information for your employees to see. Um, I think there's a lot of companies out there that cheat their employees. And I that's not my deal. I want everybody to make a good wage. I want everybody to be livable, but a lot of guys will fake their, you know, their sign in sheets. They'll fake their certified payroll reports. Um, it's something that, you know, you just don't want to do. Uh, and when they catch you, when they catch you, they're going to ban you from doing any more of that work. Um, so I've seen a lot of guys come and go like, Oh, we were bidding against this guy seemed like they were winning, they were winning, and then all of a sudden they were gone. Yeah, I could, I, yeah, I think we've all seen that if you're in the commercial space, there's always, right. you know, or they come in a new company and then 
they're gone and they come in a new company and then right. they're gone sure. and you know drive sure. each one in the ground so you're like okay sure. let's see what kind of you know, back to your other question about some of the challenges i see and that, that might be one of them you know going up against some of those guys um like I said, there's enough work for everybody. That's truly my philosophy. And we win some, we lose some. There's some that I really want to get that I don't. Um, you know, sometimes I'm surprised. Oh, we got that. Fantastic. Um, you know, bidding, you know, being from a sales background, I know you were from a sales background as well. Uh, there's an excitement to that. You know, I have sometimes I have the whole office jumping up and down as we're watching a YouTube bid opening. I'm like, ooh, all right, let's go. <laughs> That's something that I hope a lot of them continue to do is the virtual bid openings. Right, <laughs> it's like, right. this is awesome. Virtual job right. box and virtual bid openings are like my jam now. So when I see like, must be mandatory, must be in person, I'm like, I'm not sure I want to bid that job because <laughs> right. it was kind of cool. It was kind of right. cool, like sitting back on COVID, like waiting for the <laughs> stuff to come in. So, and here we are back to normal. Right. Right. <laughs> So we got a couple minutes left, buddy. Is there any other? Um, yeah. So uh, real quick, and I'll just be brief on this. If some of you guys are in a market that is union strong, what's what they call a PLA, a project labor agreement. This is when you're going to hire the union to do work. And when I say hire the union, everybody that's not union is going to say union takes longer. They do this, they do that. There's advantages to a union workforce, um, and it's an unlimited workforce right? You're going to have the guys to complete the job. When you, if you decide to go after a PLA job, you're going to go to a negotiation table with the union. And this is where you're going to say, I want two of my guy, or one of my guys to every four or two or whatever, one-to-one -one ratio. This is all negotiable. Typically the unions want to work with you. Um, they know you're just coming into this. They want to get guys out to work, but you can have, you know, different guys do. So it's a one-to-one, -one. every one of my guys, I'm going to have one of your guys. Um, so you can negotiate that, but with the unions, you can get jammed up. You really have to understand the contract. Uh, there might be rules in there that if they work through lunch, they have to get paid double time. If they, if it rains, um, you know, it's a 45 minute break paid. Uh, so there's all sorts of little union things that you have to, you have to look into and really understand that at some point, if you continue to do this work, the union's going to want you to become what they call a signatory. Um, that means you're a union shop signatory. It doesn't really work that well, at least in my experience. And maybe there's guys out there that are union shops for fencing, but it really, uh, you can only do union fence jobs. So now you get a job at the uh, auto dealership down the block and per because you're a signatory you got to put union guys on it and it's going to price you out of the projects depends on what if you're in the city if you're a fence plus company that's doing athletic fields and this and that it could really work well um you know you can also have two shops you could have one open shop company and a union shop too and when i say union all your employees don't have to be union you can have uh you know your foreman could be your foreman forever and he just happens to be your union foreman um, so there's a lot, there's more to talk about that, but if that's your market that you're in, it's definitely doable as well. And some of those jobs are nice. We've done a couple union jobs, uh, you know, big solar arrays, stuff like that. So, um, but there's a learning curve there. And I, I would just urge you to really understand, speak with the union reps, understand what you're getting into, uh, and how to accomplish the job. So everybody's happy. That's awesome, man. Yeah. We don't have unions down here, but I think that information is valuable, especially, going into other states or looking at stuff on a broader scale. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of things we can take away from that. So, um, yeah, uh, as I always say, we're going to tie this thing up with a bow and wrap her up. So what do you, um, what couple last thoughts do you want to leave with us, man? Like we went through so much over the last couple episodes here about commercial contracting in general. I just love to hear, you know, having success in that it is hard. Like, I think a lot of people think like the, like it's the golden ticket. Right, um, they've right. been doing, you know, residential fences for five years and they're like, I'm ready to go to commercial and now I'm going right. to be rich and make money. And it's like, uh, okay, right. well, you know, right. let's slow down. Uh, Chico, if it was easy, you know, everybody, everybody would, do, would it. do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Have a freaking company first, you know, or so, right. I mean, that's my, okay, here's, right. all right, here's Nathan's two cents. Have a team in place that you can actually have the infrastructure to supply and do one of these jobs, then go get some commercial jobs. 
Sure. So yeah. that's my piece. Yeah. <laughs> what do and you I would say, say, yeah, I would say the commercial business is out there and it's certainly something to entertain. Um, just be ready for it and be prepared. You know, um, that being said, I think my, some last thoughts I have is just, uh, you know, as a businessman, you know, we're, I'm sure you're doing the same thing, whether it's uh, self-help books or podcasts or whatever. We're always trying to learn a little bit more. Uh, I found this guy, Naval Ravikant. Um, he did something called a Twitter storm. It was called, if you look up the Naval Twitter storm, it'll come up on Twitter. It's called how to get rich without getting lucky. And he comes from a tech background. So he's more suited towards, you know, Silicon Valley. That being said, there's about 40 different things in there that really resonate with me. And I go back to it all the time. Um, One of them is code and media are permissionless leverage. They're leverage behind the newly rich. You can create software and media that works for you while you're asleep. And that's what you're currently doing. So congratulations. Sweet, man. Yeah. Never thought about that. Ah, <laughs> oh, so, man, I just I just grabbed a microphone and thought we'd uh, look cool <laughs> on camera and talk about business stuff. And but I, I think you're right, Eric. I mean, you know, personal growth, personal development, so vital to expanding your horizons within yourself, within your mind. And then I I often talk about with a lot of my friends, like we talk about the different tenets of who we are as a being. Right? Like, sure, you've got your body. Sure. You've got your spirit, um, you've got, you know, your mind, um, you know, your heart, all these different things. So what are we doing to enrich each one of those parts of our lives? Like, are we getting out there and moving? You know, are we, you know, doing the right things like, you know, on a, on a spiritual level, whatever that means for you, but like just sure. enriching us as a, as a human being. So that way we can get together on a podcast and hopefully teach somebody something with the experiences that we have. Right. Right. And right. Uh, that's why I do it. Cause I mean, I ain't getting paid Jack. I mean, right. everything I've been paid so far pays for all this stuff. <laughs> so at least it looks cool. Check. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, there's no check coming. Sorry, bud. <laughs> Not yet. Um, but you know, that being said, uh, you know, man, it's just such an honor to be, to be considered a friend of yours um, to share this experience. And then, um, just like in the first episode, man, you know, um, where can people reach out to you? And then I want additional questions. Like there's going to be things that guys and gals watching this, Eric are going to want to know, like, what can we do? What are the next steps? What, but, but we don't have time to answer everybody. So I want to use our resources here at protecting your radius podcast, where everyone's more than welcome to send emails over to info, I-N-F-O, at protectingyourradius.com. Send those questions and let us compile some of this information over the next couple months so we can come back later in the year and talk about these things. Maybe I'll get the turkey. I know, right? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) It may become a regular thing because I think there's always really cool stories. There's always so much specific things that happen from project to project. That I know that there's people out there, Eric, that just don't have a mentor in the space and we could utilize shows like this and the resources that we're putting were just to talk about these things and say like, hey, that's a great question. Here's an answer. Here's my thought on this. This is what we've done or whatever. But how can they follow you? Reach out to you again on social media and everything, bud. Yeah. Instagram, Spitali Construction Resources. Um and then, you know, we're trying actually on our end, we're trying to create a little bit more content as well. So I bought a drone. So I'm trying to get some new drone footage and just kind of put some cool stuff out there. It takes time though. And, you know, again, you're wearing a lot of hats, <laughs> but I'd be happy to answer any question, any question that anybody has. So no, that's so. cool. Hey, can you do drones in New York? Yeah. So it, not in New York city, but in the rest of the state. Right. All right. Oh, okay. Right. Upstate. If, if you, you, yeah. Upstate. You can get a, uh, you can get a, a license to do it in the city, but there's a lot more. The city makes everything difficult. <laughs> if I was living in upstate New York and I saw your drone flying, I'd shoot that thing down so fast. I'm sure you would. I'd be like, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, my first drone I ever got, funny side story, my first drone I ever got, I took it over to my parents' house, and they were like, oh, that's cool. Well, my one of my older brothers lives three doors down from my parents, right? And I said, hey, watch this. This is pretty cool. And they're like, oh, wow, it looks so pretty. So I'm showing them. It's all 4K and stuff. It was a DJI. And I flew it up, went down, dropped into my brother's backyard. And he's sitting on his patio and he looks up and he goes. <laughs> and and there's no audio, right? So you right. see him mouthing. Right. Right. And then all of a sudden I go and fly up. And uh, <laughs> he's 
And I said, hey, watch this. I'm going to screw with him. So I flew around over his house a couple times. Then I lowered it back down. This mug has a freaking gun. He's got his shotgun, and he's, like, racking this <laughs> thing. Know. And I go, Wee! And, and then all of a sudden, uh, like 15 minutes later, I walked down there and he goes, you son of a, I know that was you, you little bad. I'm like, all right, all right. So he was, he was, he was really giving me an earful for messing with him. But he said at first, like you saw him just kind of look around and then right, realize right. it was a drone. And then he, you know, <laughs> so don't be that guy. Especially on a commercial job <laughs> site. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, uh, oh, man, Eric, again, appreciate your time, buddy. Uh, thanks yeah, thank for investing, for everybody. Me, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate being on. I think this was fun, and I hope somebody learned a little bit of something. So, um, And we'll continue our growth, too. Yep. We're, we're ramming and jamming. And, guys, we look forward to uh, serving you every week, as we always do. And, uh, as always, we appreciate your time. You professionals, get it done. Peace. You've been listening to the Protecting Your Radius podcast from the LuxCore Studios in Bixby, Oklahoma. Thanks for sticking around and connect with us and all of our partners at www.protectingyourradius.com. We want to thank our premier partners. LuxCore, the newest line of premium quality composite infill to slide into your fence track fence system. Frame your style today. Also, Stain Track the world's first patented standalone stain machine. Utilizing flood coat technology, Stain Track covers boards, pickets, posts, and any type of dimensional wood you can think of. And what better way to use your Stain Track machine than to use the easy application Wood Defender family of stains. Wood Defender goes on easy and covers in one coat with no back brushing. And of course, the true power of our show is you, the listener. Please rate and review our show on whatever platform you consume this content. Your five-star likes and reviews help other contractors get the message that we all want to be better and do better. And in the construction world, we can never forget that before you can be great, you've got to be good. Before you can be good, you've got to be bad. But before you can even be bad, you've got to try. <laughs>